Wednesday, January 13, 1993, nine-year-old Brianne Kiner is rushed to Children's Hospital in Seattle. Tests revealed she had been infected with the deadly E. coli bacteria. The Jack in the Box outbreak was really the meat industry's 9-11. She was really the most severely injured child. I'm tired of visiting with horribly sick kids who did not have to be sick in the first place. At one point, there was a, a terrible problem with E. coli in a restaurant chain, and a number of people died, especially little children, and it really, really bothered Bruce. And he was just taking a rest after eating lunch, and when he came upstairs, he had uh, been given this idea to uh, put together this machine that, uh, at that time, we didn't know what to call it. It was a bacteria sampler. So back in 1999, um, I had a call from Bruce Bradley and he just called and asked if he could talk with me about a new technology that he had, been, he had developed. He shows up at our house and he has this new idea of a way to collect pathogens. He says, you know, I heard that you know how to develop products and that's what I've done all my life. I spent time at Utah Medical developing products. And so I was like, sure, I'll help you out. So we started working together, and he had a bunch of different ideas. He just wanted to have prototypes built. Around the time that he started having these, these thoughts about food safety, there was tons of money being poured into detection. But he started looking at more up front, well, what's being done on the sampling technology itself to collect that sample? And the answer was nothing. They were using the same sampling technologies in 2005 as they were in 1905. So he said, let's put some focus on the upfront sampling and see what we can do there. And that's kind of what started his thinking there, I believe. And uh, he came up with this amazing idea of the MBAC. In order to sell to the beef industry, we had to get what's called a letter of no objection from the USDA. What that is, it basically says that they don't object to beef processors using this technology. So once we had some interest from Cargill and National Beef and some other folks in the beef industry, we started to engage the USDA on getting this letter of no objection. It's not easy to get one of those. A lot of testing went into this. One of the things we had to do was finalize the equipment and get not just crude prototypes, but a really pretty much a final product. When you have a new technology and a new idea, the biggest hurdle is getting enough data. And so we worked together to make prototypes that made it possible for him to get, gather the data. And then as we got closer, to commercialization, the prototypes continue to get better and better. At the end, when we're handing him the product, we're up in Jerome, we walk into the conference room, we hand him the first device, and he just, his eyes just glowed, he was excited. It's just like this miracle that he now is holding something he dreamt of years and years before. It took us about two years to actually get this no objection letter, but what we found pretty fast is that even with this no objection letter, the production people were like, wait a minute, you're gonna be testing at a higher level, we're gonna have more uh, recalls, we're gonna have more bacteria that uh, we're gonna have to account for, and so the production people were pushing back, and so there started being this internal battle we figured once we got the no objection letter, the orders were just gonna start flowing in, but it didn't happen that way. There was actually a, a, a guy who was a quality assurance type um, working for one of those big companies that basically said, you know what guys, and unless the USDA puts us in an absolute headlock, we are never gonna use this system. We started just almost in a panic mode. We're like, you know what, if, if the food industry, especially the beef industry, doesn't buy the MVAC, what, what are we gonna do? On top of that, my dad, uh, who was obviously the founder and president of the company and kind of the glue that was holding everything together, was diagnosed with a grade four glioblastoma in 2008. And in the process of treating the brain tumor, they did surgery and which seriously affected his ability to think the way he used to think. When he finally passed in uh, 
March of 2009, we started really looking at everything we needed to do to, um, to continue on without him. Jared had a friend who his career was with the FBI, and he looked at the device and thought this would make a great tool for collecting DNA material. So we had gone to Sorensen Forensics. We'd got some excellent results. Um, our lab manager, he wrote an article for evidence technology. And I started getting calls from police agencies. So it really got us thinking even more. Because in the food industry, if you capture pathogens, it means they're going to have to do something to product that was going to make more money for them if there weren't any pathogens. In the forensics industry, if you capture DNA, everyone's happy, except for the perpetrator. We reached a point toward the end of 2011 that we were literally uh, out of money. We get this phone call out of the blue from this lady named Carol, and she had previously worked with Sorensen. Over the, the period of time that we had taken the MVAC down to Sorensen Forensics and asked them to test it for us in the forensic setting. She was there when, when they did that. So in the meantime, she had uh, not worked for Sorensen anymore. And so she calls us out of the blue and she said, hey, are you guys looking for any salespeople? Not knowing obviously that we were within a couple of weeks of, of shutting the company down and starting to liquidate a, all of our assets. And we get this person asking if we're hiring no, we're not hiring. <laughs> well, then Wayne and I got talking and the idea hit me. I'm like, why, why not see if she will work for on a commission basis or something like that? And so, um, just as a consultant. Because she had said that the MVAC might work in the forensics industry. So we called her back. We said, hey, would you be interested in working on a consultant basis? And she said, yeah. It was incredible. The, the, we went from the lowest of lows to actually having hope. So she came over and helped us take the technology into the hands of a number of forensic professionals. Broward County, Florida had a serious crime where, where there was a murder that had happened and the murderer was going to be released. And they had some evidence that they really believed had the DNA of the perpetrator on it. And they had tried to get it off with the swab multiple times with no, no success at all. They gave us a call and they flew Jared down and he helped him work this case. And so within a few days of the perpetrator being released, we had collected DNA material off of the evidence. I never once heard him talk about how much money he was going to make with, with MVAC. That was never on his mind. He would always talk about how it was going to help people, it was going to save lives. I think his vision was always that it was going to do that in the food industry, making our food chain safer. But I think he'd be very pleased to see that it's uh, serving the forensics industry so well and finding people that have committed just heinous crimes and then even exonerating people that have been imprisoned wrongfully. We believe in this product. We know that this, that the MVAC system will work and there's a need for it. Helping solve 50-year-old cold cases, um, it doesn't get any better than that.